to introduce our speaker, Dr. Colette Pat. Colette is the Assistant Dean for Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Access in the Mathematical and Physical Sciences Division. She is also the uh, Director of the Berkeley Science Network and the new MPS Pro uh, Scholars Program, as well as uh, other campus and regional programs. Colette uh, leads the effort uh, across the division to increase diversity and achieve equitable outcomes at the undergraduate, graduate, postdoctoral, and faculty levels. For decades, Colette has been working without, um, Colette has been working behind the scenes with our physics department to advance diversity. Um, she received her BA in English and Women's Studies and her PhD in Social and Cultural Studies in Education at UC Berkeley. Her scholarly work focuses on academic life, identity, race, ethnicity, gender, socioeconomic status, disability in higher education and inst institutional change. She has co-authored highly cited work on creating pathways to success for uh, BIPOC and women PhD students in STEM fields. And um, uh, I, I'm looking forward to I'm looking forward to hearing from uh, Colette on promising current efforts and data-driven evidence-based approaches to make a change. And also let me take this opportunity to thank her for the Herculean work behind the scenes to increase diversity at all levels through the years. So, uh, thank you so much, Ari. Thank you for inviting me to present the colloquium. I feel incredibly honored to be allowed into the physics community to present on the work we've done primarily in the mathematical physical sciences division. And I also wanna say, I feel particularly close to the department. So it, it really um, does feel like a real honor and a real privilege to be with you. I've worked with many of uh, the students and faculty in the department over the years with the diversity, um, equity, inclusion committee, um, with the department chairs, um, and I have had the enormous privilege to work for two physicists in the time I've been here, the person who, um, who hired me, Buford Price, and um, the most uh, recent dean, uh, Francis Hellman. And I have learned so much from physicists. I've learned, uh, among other things, how to, um, how to think a little bit more like a scientist and um, how scientists think, which is, um, has been transformative and just fantastic for me personally. So I'm, um, I'm going to, uh, I'm, I, I was asked to talk about some of the initiatives that we've been working on and to give you a sense of um, how we think about some of the issues related to DEI in the division. I would have loved to highlight everything going on in the department and the many things over the years that have gone on in the department. Um, this has been a, a really activist department around DEI in the best sense of the word, you know, really taking issues seriously and um, working hard to address them, engaging in research and critical, really critical thinking about um, how to move the needle in uh, increasing the representation of people from groups that are historically underrepresented in the science, technology, engineering, and math fields and physics in particular. Um, so there's been a ton of work in the department and I cannot possibly represent it all. So I've tried to just um, highlight the things mostly going on at the division that have implications for the department or include the department and where possible highlight the issues for the department. I will start by talking about, well, throughout the talk, I will address some of the seemingly intractable problems related to or challenges related to DEI um, that are the kinds of um, issues and challenges that are um, mind to try to work with the departments to solve. And I hope by the end of the talk, you will feel like um, you, will, you will feel and see and understand that some of those problems are not as intractable as they may appear, um, that we can actually make a huge difference. Um, I will try to give a bit of the history so you can see how our thinking has evolved over time. Uh, in the division, and I will, MPS, by the way, is Mathematical and Physical Sciences. I'll be using a couple of these acronyms uh, throughout, and so um, if you have questions about that, please feel free to put that in the chat. Um, and I'll highlight some of the promising um, current efforts, 
and then talk about some approaches that we can take based on data that we have analyzed very rigorously and evidence that we've had, that we've accumulated along the way over the years here and um, observed at other places. I am your mathematical and physical sciences, diversity, equity, inclusion, and access officer. And um, above all, I want you to know that I'm available to you in uh, er every member of the department and alumni, and I'm happy to engage with, um, with you to, to help you with projects, to work with you, to address issues of concern to you, um, to discuss things with you, to show you uh, what we're doing and um, open the research world that we work in to you as well. So please do not hesitate to contact me. I am really here for the departments. So um, I want you to know that I'm accessible to you. Uh, next slide. Okay, um, what, uh, let's look at what underrepresented, yeah, go ahead, next slide. Let's, thank you, Ori. Ori's in control of the slides here so, so that I can just concentrate on what I'm saying. Um, so let's talk about what underrepresentation means. And um, here, so there are a lot of acronyms and I, it's sometimes easy to just, uh, you know, use them and, and not really think very critically about them. But here, um, I want to point out that the US population has been um, in the uh, percentage of African Americans, Chicanx, Latinx, Native Americans has been increasing in the population of the United States. But those same groups, which are the groups we, um, we uh, referred to as historically underrepresented minorities, those members of those groups have not necessarily been um, increasing their representation in the mathematical, physical, computer, and engineering sciences. That's that long acronym, sometimes called STEM, but excluding the biological sciences and so, socio, social and behavioral sciences. So um, that's what that acronym is about. The underrepresented minorities have not been increasing their share at the same rate necessarily that their share of um, spots in the population has been increasing. And so we see this, we have, we started many years ago with, um, extreme underrepresentation, and we see that underrepresentation persist. Um, in the past 10 years, there's been, you know, really, really minimal um, change to the particularly, there's been really no change practically, practically flat, um, the, the percentage has been practically flat at the postdoc and faculty level. Uh, PhDs have increased very slightly, underrepresented minority PhDs, um, and the BA degrees have increased a little more rapidly. Uh, next slide. I want to uh, problematize, if you will, the terms underrepresented minority and majority here. And I particularly, there are many different axes along I could along which I could problematize these terms. But for the purpose of this particular talk, I wanna talk about what these terms might mean in the physics department specifically right now. Um, so um, I'm not going, going to run through all these, um, these numbers one by one, but um, I invite you to just take a look at this slide and get a sense of it. There are groups in the department that are really severely underrepresented. So if we look at um, the third uh, bullet point down under race, ethnicity, citizenship, the uh, historically underrepresented minority groups, um, we can see that that's a very small number of the total number of declared majors. So there are 221 declared majors in 2020-2021. Those these numbers are pretty consistent over time, or these, um, these percentages are pretty consistent over time, not the actual absolute numbers, but the percentages. Um, and you, we can see that if uh, you are a member of an underrepresented minority group, there are a very small number of people like you in the department. At the same time, I want you to, to and this is also true for women on the, in the next column, right? I want you to though, at the same time, take a look at the number of white and other, which um, other includes people who decline to state, um, members of the department and, or declared majors, these are declared majors. And um, in particular, um, to think about the fact that uh, white and other men are also not a majority, right? So 
On the one hand, we have groups that are that you know are very severely underrepresented, very few in number, very few in percentage. And on the other hand, we actually have a lot of heterogeneity in the in the undergraduate population of declared majors in physics. If we add in, which we 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 these data are not data that are made public, but if we were to also add in um, the number of uh, other minoritized or marginalized or potentially marginalized groups uh, like disabled students, low income students, first generation students, you would see even more complexity to the heterogeneity of, of the undergraduate majors. Uh, next slide. Okay, here what I want to do is contextualize um, physics in terms of the national um, physics community and our peer institutions. And here, um, there are included in the peer institutions are about uh, nine or 10 other institutions that include Harvard, MIT, Caltech, Stanford on the private side, uh, Georgia Tech, uh, University of Washington, University of Michigan. Um, and you'll see the list a little later on the UCLA on the public side. So that's who we, we've just captured a group that um, according to the National Research Council rankings are our peer institutions. Um, and if you look at the, these uh, bar graphs, you can see that um, nationally, Berkeley's uh, representation of Berkeley, the percentage of underrepresented minorities in the physics pipeline, the BA degree recipients, the enrolled graduate students, so there's a slightly different measures there, right? One is degree recipients, one is enrolled graduate students, and the postdocs, that we, um, we, are doing slightly better in terms of undergraduate uh, degrees granted. We are um, at about the same level, roughly a little below with enrolled graduate students. And the postdoc level, we're very low. Um, the postdoc level, that is a very small number um, in general. So everybody is extremely low. Um, okay, let's next slide. Um, I want, because um, Asian Americans very often are not um, are sort of invisibilized in these data. I wanted to specifically take a moment to pull out Asian Americans in the physics pipeline um, to see their representation. And here, um, I want to particularly point out the drop off from uh, the drop off at Berkeley and at our peer institutions in physics from the graduate level to the postdoc level. So I, I'm. Um, uh, hoping that you can see that um, the picture with Asian Americans may be a little different than some uh, conventionally held perceptions. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, here what I'd like to do is drawing on work done by um, uh, Andrew Epic and his colleagues. Um, talk a little bit about this is undergraduate majors and their outcomes. Um, and here what we're looking at is a graph showing uh, the, the, um, uh, how the, percent, the number of, of students who intend our mathematical and physical science majors uh, when they come in as, uh, as freshmen, um, the number that graduate um, just with any degree, the number that graduate with a STEM degree, and the number that graduate in with a major in um, our division, mathematical and physical science division. And here you can see that there, those numbers are, um, there are disparate outcomes or there's disparate persistence for uh, students who are, uh, who are underrepresented minority and also who are women compared to the overall um, population of intended majors. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, now that, that uh, those data are really just to try to give you a snapshot or a picture of the size of the, 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 size of the population and where people are in, um, in terms of graduating, in terms of declaring the major, how we compare to our national, uh, the national statistics in physics and how we compare to uh, um, a reasonable peer group, right, in physics. Here, what I'm going to do is take a step back and describe some of what we've done over time in the division 
and how our thinking about um, what we do in the DEI world has changed. So I want to start by saying that um, the, the, some of the issues that affect, and I, um, you'll, although I will talk to some degree about women and other underrepresented groups, my focus in this talk is really on uh, racial and ethnic minorities. So you will see um, or minor, re, re, uh, people who are minoritized based on their race and ethnicity in our system. And so what you'll see is um, that that's the focus and that's pretty much mostly where my talk is, is uh, you know, is going to have emphasis. So some of the issues that we see for underrepresented minority students have been clear to us for many, many years, really for decades, and to many, many people in the department, the faculty, prior department chairs for decades as well. One of the first initiatives that um, started, at least while I have been here, uh, in the 1990s was started by graduate students, and it was what we might call version one of the physics uh, scholars program. And that was a program that really concentrated on um, providing excellent uh, pedagogy, peer support, um, and uh, developing a sense of belonging and helping students who were not coming out of, um, you know, prep school environments, but were coming out of less well-resourced high school environments to uh, achieve, um, to achieve uh, once they got to college. That, uh, that program was started by physics students based on their experience working with engineers in physics. It mostly attracted engineering students who were taking physics 7a and 7b, the, the physics introductory sequence. Um, and it had, it really did have a, a, some success. Um, students' grades were, you know, elevated somewhat if they were in that, those intensive discussion sections and part of the physics scholars program. But one thing that happened in, and, and, and the students running that program went on to become um, really uh, some of the major forces in the world of physics education today, faculty around the country. Uh, so that was a, an important experience for them as graduate students as well. One of the problems with that, with the design of that approach was that it was a, an approach that was restricted to underrepresented minority students. They were invited into it. Nobody else could get into those sections. Um, and, uh, you know, when something uh, works well, right, others want that. So this is a program that I would call this, my own terminology, kind of a pullout program. It pulled the students of a, of a certain demographic group or set of demographic groups with a particular kind of uh, need for resources and um, support and um, opportunity into, uh, into a separate environment from the the conventional flow of the educational environment in the physics department. Um, it gave them access to kind of specialized, um, excellent specialized resources. Um, and it kind of separated them out from the rest of the physics community, right? Uh, in order to gain those resources. Well, as soon as other students figured out what was going on, they, they wanted to access those same excellent resources, right? And among those students were many who had, um, in the eyes of the GSIs running those sections and, and, um, and the people involved in it, had legitimate claim to need those specialized resources uh, based on also being first generation to college, not having gone to highly resourced high schools, um, uh, feeling that they, a sense of not belonging in the department based on other ascriptive characteristics about themselves. And eventually that program kind of uh, in some ways broke down, it, it, um, it kind of collapsed on itself in a way because of that, uh, because of the high demand for something highly valuable, right? And so uh, attempts were made to try to reform the discussion sections as a whole at the time and to spread the value of what was going on there, but it was very difficult to achieve the same effect. Um, out of that, out of, uh, the sort of vacuum that was left when PSP uh, stopped operating, Compass was formed. And Compass, again, is a program run by graduate students with a very um, uh, you know, positive impact that creates a sense of belonging and community among students from diverse groups that provides a really great source of professional development for the 
the graduate students involved and um, uh, and you know is a is a really has is and has been a homegrown effort in the department and has been successful. Um, it has for a variety of reasons, kind of a small footprint in part because some aspects of it are, are expensive and difficult to sustain in part because it has some features that also contain the sort of pull out function. And we can talk about other reasons why, but um, one important um, asset of Compass is that it is it has been created and run by graduate students. One um, problem about Compass is that it does not involve the faculty. So it's, it's a program that uh, doesn't involve the entire department. Okay. Um, not in relation to either of these things, but because we were able to do this, we created a program called the Berkeley Science Network that worked across um, all the physical science departments, the mathematical and physical science departments, wherever they were, including chemistry and CS and so on. Um, there shouldn't be a question mark at the end of that statement. It did do that. And um, again, it was a program that was a kind of pullout program for students from underrepresented groups specifically. It was um, not focused on uh, developing, uh, on providing academic opportunity or skill, academic skill development. It was focused on generating a sense of community and belonging, on um, addressing, um, uh, you know, confronting um, the problem of stereotypes that threaten students, uh, that can be threat, can, can form psychological threats to students when they're in the classroom and relatively isolated. It addressed psychological factors like. Uh, something we call imposter syndrome, where people who who um, legitimately belong in a place are excellent and capable in a place don't don't believe that about themselves, in part because of the way that often they're treated or the way that they perceive treatment. So that it dealt with a lot of those psychological factors. All of these uh, programs had some effect, but they all they all also have a certain kind of common feature to them in being uh, what I would describe as to some degree, this is less so true of Compass, I wanna point that out, but the other programs somewhat pull out programs. Um, what happened in about 2014 is that the Dean at the time, Mark Richards um, was also the executive Dean and he, uh, he became concerned about the capping of majors uh, based on a GPA threshold requirement. So what that meant was that um, departments like economics um, were starting to, uh, and, and computer science, were starting to say that students, in order to declare the major at the junior, the junior year level, undergraduates declaring the major at the junior year, would have to have achieved a certain GPA to gain admission to that major. So he became concerned about this and he looked into it. And there was some concern that the departments in our division would also start to cap the major, uh, their majors. So um, he called me in and he said, I am really concerned, I have a hunch that this is going to be disastrous in terms of our diversity, our DEI efforts, in part because we know that many of the students who are underrepresented um, along many different axes, including first gen, including in, you know, um, in interaction with uh, being racial minorities, low income students, et cetera, um, don't get the same preparation in high school. They aren't exposed to the same content. And therefore, once they come to, when they come to college, it may take them a little longer to absorb that content. They may need, just need a longer period than students who have already covered all of that in high school. And they will catch up. They do catch up. They are the best students coming out of their high schools. They are bound and determined to catch up. They are dedicated to studying the fields that are of interest to them. But if they are not afforded long enough to do that, um, they will be systematically um, uh, derailed from studying the subjects of interest to them. And this was this capping of majors was particularly going on in the STEM fields, um, as well as some of the language, the language um, departments. So I, I've given a few of the examples of that below there. But it was at this point that we started to really dig into data and, um, and start to really partner with Andrew Epic, who 
I hope is here. And most of the graphs and figures you see here are his work um, in who was, who was and is in the Vice Chancellor for Equity and Inclusion Office. He's an analyst. He also works with the office of uh, the uh, planning office for the campus. Um, and we started to pull lots of data on what, how students were performing in the lower division, whether we could see um, uh, uh, disparate, uh, anything disparate between students of different groups, how long it might take students to catch up, whether we, what we could um, see about in and, and out migration from our major for students from different, from our majors for students from different groups who was coming in, who was saying they wanted to be in, but leaving. And um, we became very engaged with the university's uh, full scale data set on students and their, um, their patterns of declaring majors and looking for looking to see if what effect capping majors might have. And this really turned us around in terms of looking very um, rigorously at, at um, data, at, at institutional data and looking for um, the evidence of where we might find um, points of leverage where we, could, um, where we could intervene or have a positive effect. Uh, next slide. I should say, or where we, you know, it's okay to go to the slide, or where we could, um, or where we needed to be careful about seemingly neutral measures or seemingly neutral policies that would have a disparate impact on students. Okay. We did, um, we ran a very small program uh, based on the data that we saw where we did see that there were different, um, different levels of um, achievement at the lower division that were, um, that appeared to be related to um, and, and correlated to differences in um, uh, population group, demographic group. Uh, and so we did, we started to do, um, a program we called Summer Rising. It was just a pilot program, but, uh, and it had some, you know, it seemed to be pointing in the right direction, but it wasn't until um, recently when uh, Francis Hellman became the Dean that we were able to, um, we got a, a substantial gift from the, the Kwam Family Foundation. And we were able to, at that point, really dig into this problem and look very critically at it. And so along those lines, we ran a project that we at first called the Alex Project. Now it is called Pre-Calculus Essentials. And um, you can look that up on the Berkeley website at the math department, and you can see what that project is about. Um, but we spent really a number of years asking students to take incoming um, freshmen or students involved it, it enrolled in lower division math classes. We asked them to take an assessment, an off-the-shelf ins- assessment, to see what their level of preparation was in calculus. The upshot was that we did see um, differences in uh, preparation based on different demographic groups, and we also saw something that we, um, you know, that, that really made us sit up and take notice, which was that all of our all of our students, or well, I shouldn't say all of our students, all of the students who took of the students who took this assessment, many, and I'd go so far as to say most, had some important gaps in their pre-calculus preparation. So there was a we could see that there was a very high percentage of our students, regardless of any other demographic factor who had serious gaps in their preparation. And out of that, um, out of that, those data was born the Pre-Calculus Essentials Project, an approach to making it possible for any undergraduate who's taking a lower division calculus course to come uh, early into the process and um, really kind of beef up their skills to be ready for calculus so that they can do well in calculus, so that they can enjoy calculus, so that they can increase, get um, good grades in calculus and enhance their possibility of enjoying and wanting to stay in the quantitative disciplines. Along with this project, we also created something called the Undergraduate Diversity, Equity, Inclusion and Access Task Force. And that task force had representatives from faculty, um, students and staff across our division. And it spent over a year studying the problems related to, um, that were affecting undergraduates um, differentially that could perhaps explain why we had those uh, differential uh, levels of persistence in declaring our majors. 
Um, one of the, one of the uh, um, projects that that task force did is it ran a very open-ended qualitative survey um, of all intended majors in MPS and all declared majors in MBS, MPS so that students could tell us in their own words why they had chosen our majors or why they had um, selected other majors. And we learned a huge amount by coding and analyzing those data qualitatively with a team of, um, with a team of graduate students, faculty and staff from the division and uh, coming to understand what um, what students were telling us, what their experiences were, and how they might differ by virtue of their uh, demographic group and their year in school and their department. Out of that task force came two major recommendations. The two top, there were many recommendations. These were the top two. One was to improve the discussion sections, um, to take better advantage of all of the discussion um, section offerings, at, especially at the lower division, to ensure that all students were, were gaining greater opportunity through those sections. And the second was to create a wraparound program that we call the MPS Scholars Program that would be deeply embedded in, rooted in, come out of, be part of um, um, the, each of the departments that would not be kind of what I'm, what I have been calling a pullout program. That would be a program that was owned by the departments, that is owned, will be owned by the departments, that will, um, you know, will welcome into the departments the, you know, heterogeneous, the actual heterogeneous population of undergraduates that we have, and will provide um, great opportunities for mentoring and support of those students, um, will provide research opportunities or support for research opportunities, a lot of information, discussions about what it is like to be a physics student, depending on your identity, who you are and so on, or in the math department, a math student and so on. And then some crossover activities across the entire division that will allow for um, kind of a fluidity for the students to move across the division, see the entire division and feel at home in the whole division, but that will be rooted in each department. And um, we've been very fortunate in being able to um, uh, be awarded funding to support that program by the Moore Foundation and Francis Hellman, who was the Dean as that was awarded. And this was a huge commitment on her part to see this project supported and funded, continues as the principal investigator on that project. So I have the um, benefit of continuing to, to work with, uh, with Francis on that. And that project is just starting up. It's a three-year project, which we will um, uh, get off the ground in the next few months. Uh, by fall of next year, it should be fully operational. Um, we will um, be calling on, on um, members of the department to get involved in it in various ways. Next slide. Okay, what have we learned? And I'm gonna just quickly do this because I also want to, I will not be able to touch as extensively, but I do wanna touch briefly on graduate issues and postdoctoral issues. So what have we learned through all of this work and particularly the um, really kind of intensive focus on data and understanding in a, in a really a rigorous way, the evidence around programs, what have we come to understand over time? Well, we do, we, we see that there are residual impacts of inequalities and inequities from high school that, that come, you know, that, that we, um, we see in the student population that comes to us as entering freshmen. Right? There are also inequities and inequalities between the, fresh, the students who come to us as freshmen and the transfer students. So I don't, don't want to be remiss and not mention the transfer students. Um, but we feel that these, are, that these issues can be addressed, that, um, the, there is, that there are ways that we can address this and that we can address this at scale for all students coming into the division across the board and that some of these, um, some of the, that, the, that the issues are perhaps in some ways more complex than we might initially have acknowledged, that um, they're not, um, there, there are um, both inequities and inequalities and also some similarities between students across groups. All right, but high school academic opportunity and 
what that means for students when they come here as freshmen is not the only issue. There are other issues like the kinds of issues that we had started to see many, many years ago, you know, as far back as the 1990s in the first iteration of Physics Scholars Program that it was designed to address that have to do with how students' interests or what they, what they will label as interests are conditioned by the programs that they come into, the way that they're received, the, um, what they experience from their peers, from faculty, from near peers, from mentors or people they would like to be mentors, from graduate students, um, whether they get support um, to develop those interests, whether there's an understanding of their determination and their, um, uh, you know, uh, their, their real um, capacity to go on and be incredibly successful in these fields, um, and whether that, you know, how that is received and how that is supported. And those are some of the um, psychological, sociological, kind of, if you will, community issues that also need to be expressed and that also need to be addressed and um, that we also uh, see reported in um, not only the UDI, um, uh, UDEIA study that we did, but also in the campuses, um, my experience survey and other climate surveys. So some of these issues can be, can be addressed. In fact, I would say, I am confident that we can address all of these issues through these two promising new strategies that we have. One is um, looking uh, really um, seriously at supporting students to enhance their preparation, their quantitative preparation, particularly calculus, their preparation of calculus. And the other is in providing a wraparound program um, deeply rooted in the department that welcomes all students, recognizes the heterogeneity, supports and celebrates the heterogeneity and the differences among our students um, and builds community for every student that wants to be in the division. Okay, so that, uh, next slide. And, and I, I wanna emphasize that your involvement, the involvement of the entire community is welcomed in that and will be appreciated and will be asked for and what you do will be valued. <laughs> so I wanted to say that. Um, okay, the PhD level. I'm going to say something very basic because I wanna be sure that we have time for some questions at the end. And um, I mostly wanted to bring to you the news about the MPS Scholars Program, the Pre-Calculus Essentials Program, and what we're doing at the undergraduate level because that is very new um, and very different than approaches we've taken in the past. Some people in the department have heard me talk over time about the graduate issues. And um, here, what I want to do is really just highlight one program that we see that even though the changes that it made were incremental and small, I want to highlight it because I want to emphasize how it is in fact possible to address um, problems that we think are intractable. So until 2000, so we're going pretty far back here, until 2000, for at least a decade or more, um, admissions to the department and the mathematical and physical sciences in general, this is true. And this is, also in, this is also quite consistent with most departments around the campus, right? Um, were in sort of low single digit numbers and students who, um, there were some years where no underrepresented minority students were admitted or none and or none came. Um, and then in 2000, we saw a jump. We saw a change in those, in those numbers. It wasn't a huge jump, but it was a jump. And we saw an end to the um, problem of no uh, underrepresented minority students being admitted or coming to the department. That, that problem just ended. And I want to, um, so I'm not gonna say that we achieved or even came close to achieving or have achieved or have come close to achieving the kind of representation that we need at the graduate level, we have not. We are nowhere near that. We have severe underrepresentation of um, members of historically underrepresented minority groups. But I do want to talk about what happened there. So, next slide. In 2000, we instituted a pre application recruitment conference for prospective. Um, students who wanted to, who, who uh, we thought might want to come, prospective graduate students, so uh, graduating 
um, uh, undergraduates around the country who we thought we might might want to come to Berkeley, but um, who would normally not apply. They were at schools that were not that that didn't normally send us um, graduate student applicants. Um, they were um, students who were uh, not all, but predominantly from underrepresented minority groups. And um, we wanted to reach out and see if we could identify students who would do very well here, who had a great deal of promise, but didn't come from our conventional kind of sources of um, graduate student applicants. Uh, so we reached out to his, historically black colleges and universities, minority serving institutions. We reached out to our own PhD alumni and asked if they were working with students from underrepresented groups who were very promising, um, who, who they thought might succeed here in the ways that they had succeeded. We developed collaborations with um, underrepresented minority scientists around the country, and we asked them to work with us to bring them to, to, to encourage their students to apply here. And you can see um, that jump up, so not, not a huge jump, right? But you can see just a bump up in those early years after the, um, the, uh, we started doing the Berkeley Edge Conference. Well, over time, that bump up was sustained. Um, we calculated that probably about um, somewhere between 15 and 20% of the entering class of underrepresented minority students in the fields that um, the Berkeley Edge worked on, that about 15 to 20% of the inter entering um, minority graduate students had come through this Berkeley Edge Conference, right? They had in some way participated in this. And, um, but over time, we, we had a variety of different funding sources and over time, the funding for it was no longer there and we were working on other priorities and we let the conference lapse for a few years. And after that, um, Francis, the, who was Dean, came to me and said, what is going on with our undergraduate, with, with our, I'm sorry, our graduate minority enrollments? Why have they dropped in the division? And it was a small, small numbers um, and, a, and a small drop, but it was consistent. And it occurred to us that that was the effect of having let go of the Berkeley Edge Conference. And so as a result, we have now reinstated that conference. Um, but I want to point this out because you know, in so many ways, when we started this conference back in 2000, many years ago now, right, um, the prevailing wisdom, the conventional wisdom was that there were not, there were not minority students out there, there were not underrepresented minority students out there who, who could come to Berkeley and succeed or that we could find. And I know that sounds preposterous right now, but that is really, that was a that was a part of the prevailing wisdom. And this conference really proved that that was not the case and it proved that if we really did our footwork, if we really went out and, and, and um, thought about how to, um, what at the time was called prospect for promise, right? That we could actually find, um, we could find students and they, they, they are there. And they are promising and they do want to come to Berkeley if we invite them and support them in submitting those applications and give them um, some technical assistance so they know how because they're coming out of institutions where their peers are not doing this necessarily or not coming to Berkeley and they may not have anticipated that this would be their path. Next slide. Okay. Um, I'm not really gonna explain this in any detail except to point you to the publication where it says source, if you'd like to know more about this. But um, mostly what I'm going to say here, uh, really kind of uh, to briefly talk about this is that recruitment at the graduate level is not the only issue, um, not by any stretch of the imagination. Once students come here, there are all those other um, individual level factors we spoke about, psychological impact of being a minoritized person in a culture, um, you know, in a culture where you are one of only a few people um, who, who um, you share a fair amount of, you know, your, your uh, background and, um, and experience with. So there are lots of those uh, lots of those issues. There are issues about how you're received, how you're perceived, and how you're treated that need to be addressed. Um, sometimes those are really hard to measure and to document 
uh, very clearly. But we were able to get to, um, we were able to understand one thing very clearly based on a survey that we did that we called the Berkeley Life and Science Survey. We surveyed graduate students across um, all of the mathematical and physical sciences broadly read, so our division, BECS and chemistry. And we found a, a result that, um, that you know, really um, challenged us to think about the structure of our graduate programs and what we're delivering to our graduate students and whether we're delivering either um, uh, um, in form or content uh, uh, different, um, uh, different kinds of resources or different kinds of encouragement or support um, or, or not. And so here, what we saw is that um, when we asked students to report whether they had submitted a paper for publication, and we controlled for many factors, how far along they were in their program, um, uh, uh, which program, they, which department they were in, um, whether they had passed their quals or not, all of that, we controlled for that. When we asked them whether they had submitted a paper for publication, what we found is that in chemistry, there was really uh, no noteworthy difference between um, women underrepresented minorities and non -minority, their non-minority male counterparts. But when we looked at our division and EECS, there were differences, noteworthy differences. And this um, got us into a, um, a, a um, way of looking at departments and trying to understand what it is about different departments that might lead to this outcome. Next slide. Um, Along those lines, we, we, so we could see the effect. We have some ideas about what might be at work here, um, but we decided that we really needed more data. We needed to know and we needed to understand better. And so before we really kind of got too um, adamant about what we thought the solution might be. And so along these lines, we started a research project that is a year, uh, a year into its course, it's a three-year project, um, studying graduate student life and experience, studying the structure of graduate programs and how they work. And we are actually just finishing up the interviews. It's a qualitative study. We interview faculty and graduate students and the staff who work with students. And we are just finishing those interviews up in physics. If you have not signed up for an interview and you would like to, uh, please let me know. Um, all of our graduate students and all of our faculty are invited to participate in those interviews and we would really love to um, learn about your experiences and put your experiences into the study um, so that we can arrive at, you know, really evidence-based and database conclusions about why we see these differences in departments and what we can do about them. In the meantime, I know my colleague uh, Denzel um, uh, is in Denzel Street in the um, in the graduate division has set up a program for first year students to talk with them about making sure that they're on course for their academic careers and thinking about publication and so on. Okay, next. Uh, okay, I have many things to say about postdocs, but this is going to be like a very 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 brief explanation about what we're doing at the postdoc level. So postdocs are kind of the availability pool it, for faculty jobs in most of the MPS fields. And you saw a little earlier those statistics that I showed you about the drop-off from the graduate level where abysmally low uh, representation of underrepresented minorities that requires our attention, right? 5% underrepresented minorities. And yet, as low as that is, there is yet another drop off to the postdoc level to 3%. So a project that we started, um, uh, next slide, called the California Alliance was designed to try to address this, just this drop off, that challenge alone, right? <laughs> Which is by no means the most ambitious challenge that we have as a community, um, and yet a very difficult uh, challenge to succeed at to see if we could basically stop that drop off, if we could um, have the same percentage of underrepresented minorities who are earning PhDs in the mathematical, physical sciences and engineering and computer sciences go on 
uh, to postdoctoral positions, the stepping stone to faculty jobs. There are a variety of programs that we set up under the California Alliance to do this, and I'm going to refer you to a website if you want to know more about them, but I'm going to tell you what the outcome of that was. So uh, next slide, please. The California Alliance was the four kind of um, top tier institutions, if you will, public and private west of the Mississippi. And um, what we were able to do, among other things, is create a postdoc program where, again, it was a little bit of proof of concept that um, if we set up a postdoc program with the right kind of features designed correctly, with the right kind of support and encouragement, that we could identify underrepresented minority postdocs, um, uh, graduate students who, could, who wanted to go on into postdoctoral positions and we could encourage them, um, encourage them and um, where they were uh, highly competitive for those positions, we could place them. And that, that in fact happened. And so during a period where the rest of the country was um, the representation of minority, minorities at the postdoc level was in decline in these fields, the California Alliance was actually able to increase the representation of underrepresented minority postdocs at our institutions. And this is an effect that we, it's a small effect, but an effect that we consider to be really important in demonstrating what is possible with the right, um, uh, perspective, data, and approaches, strategies. And so along those lines, next slide, um, we established the Research University Alliance. And this is a broader alliance. I think there are nine institutions, and we are working collaboratively to solve this um, same kind of issue of drop off of, of underrepresented minorities from the PhD recipient level to the postdoc level. It has a, a number of features, including a, a very new thing, a concierge service that students can um, you know, contact an actual person who can advise them and help them match to existing postdoctoral opportunities. One of the key features of this program, it's built on uh, using a lot of the design, the, the design and the um, strategies that we used in the California Alliance. One of the key features of it is that we now have a postdoc portal where we are asking faculty at these nine institutions in the mathematical, physical sciences, um, engineering fields, and environmental sciences to post open positions right? So post your open postdoc positions, and we're inviting um, students, so this is not limited to underrepresented minority students, but we are really reaching out to and encouraging underrepresented minority students in particular to post uh, profiles of themselves, which there's a form that you fill out that goes to the concierge so that the concierge can start to figure out um, where faculty might have openings and might want to receive an application from a student from an underrepresented group. So um, we, don't have, we don't have a postdoc program that we're hiring into. We aren't making the hiring decisions, um, but we are not at all or even uh, influencing them. But what we feel that we can make a difference by doing is by making postdoc positions known um, if there's not even a requirement right now to post a, an opening for a postdoc position and to ensure that students from underrepresented groups are aware of those openings and also that faculty are, um, are able to see applications uh, from underrepresented students and we're helping to um, encourage students to submit applications. Okay, again, um, list your postdoc positions if you're faculty. If you are students and first term postdocs, please go check out the website. See if you'd like to fill out one of those uh, forms to put your profile into the portal and check in with the concierge. She is there to help. Next slide. Um, I'm going to end here and say just a few conclusions. And I just have two slides about this. One is, Leadership really counts. I hope that from the, um, the way I've told the sort of history in very, you know, I know very briefly and in a rushed fashion, but I hope that you can see how important the deans have been in this, the department chairs, 
And there is a really important role for leadership at every level with this and attentiveness to this. So um, committee chairs in the department, people who run research centers, um, who have grants to run research centers, faculty, because the faculty are leaders in their fields and in their disciplines and in the department, and from the students, student organizational leaders, do not consider the, um, the difficult issues related to DEI intractable or that you cannot or should not have a role in this. Um, it will take the community working together to address these problems and it is possible to address them and it is possible to have gains. Um, small actions at the interpersonal level can be very detrimental or very positive. Don't underestimate what, how important those interactions are. Um, value your peers, understand that there's heterogeneity in the department. Many levels of heterogeneity do not assume homogeneity among the students or faculty or postdocs in the department. There are many layers of heterogeneity. Um, and for everybody, engage in and contribute to the, not just the interpersonal, but also the structural um, changes that we're trying to make. And last, but by no means least, add to this list, add the things that you think need to be done to this list. And there's one very last slide, I believe, which is about structure. All of these individual actions are crucially important, but they are also not enough. We have to tackle the structural conditions that lead to these disparate and differential outcomes and that lead to this disparate and different kinds of experiences for students. But we have to also recognize that small gains over time accumulate and can produce, measure, can produce measurable gains. Um, I really want to um, encourage everybody to turn your back on despair and despondency and cynicism because we have reset the bar we keep resetting the bar. We keep pushing the bar higher on what can be accomplished. We're nowhere near where we need to be. I'm not, not going to assert that. We have a very long way to go. But cynicism keeps pulling us down to the point zero again. And it doesn't allow us to keep building from where we are to the next level to increase uh, our effectiveness. And so I, I just... Um, I just want to ask for uh, uh, people to get involved, to um, understand that what DEI work does in the end benefits the people most deeply affected by um, bias, by racism, by um, disparate treatment. It also improves the entire community and the, the underlying structures and conditions that support the advancement, the development and advancement of all scientists. And on that note, I'm going to close. Thank you, Colette, please, uh, for uh, creating and leading these uh, exciting new opportunities. And uh, please join me in thanking Colette. Um, and I think we are probably over time, but uh, we, we should have time for a few uh, questions. So please raise your hand. And, or you feel free to get rid of the slides if you'd like to. Oh, yes, thanks. So, uh, let me see if there are any questions. Uh, uh, I see uh, Alexandra and then Wick. Yeah, hi, thank you so much for the talk. Um, yeah, I, I definitely think that the pre-calc uh, class, uh, we had something similar at my university and I definitely think it's an effective way to get other students uh, whose high school backgrounds were not as strong kind of on the same playing field. Um, I think one of the more striking parts of your talk was when you showed that graph of students who um, intend to declare STEM majors and kind of the drop off um, for how many students actually end up declaring STEM majors. Um, I know there was a difference for, you know, like uh, 
male versus female students and underrepresented minorities. But I think what was more striking was just that like the drop off for everyone was so intense. And I was wondering actually if you could comment more on that. Um, I don't know if that's unique to Berkeley or that's kind of, I don't know if you know whether or not that's seen kind of universally across all universities um, and whether the survey that you guys did kind of gave any more indication about like why you see such a large drop off for it kind of it, what what scares me is it it seems to indicate like you have we have all these students coming in with an interest in STEM and then like they go to college and all of a sudden they're not interested in science anymore like that that seems to me like we're doing something really wrong um so I was wondering if you had more to say on that yeah so um I can't necessarily speak with authority on what happens at other institutions. I can say that drop-off happens across STEM fields. So it's not only in our division, but we are concerned it happens across STEM fields, but we are of course, ex we're in our division. That's where we focus on the problem um, or focus on the issue. There's, um, there's some part of that that isn't a problem. And there's some part of it that maybe as you're pointing out, right? So the part of it that isn't a problem is that students as undergraduates are admitted here into the College of Letters and Science they intend a certain major and they declare that they intend that major. But um, along the path, they have the opportunity to become interested in other things and to explore other things that they maybe never encountered in high school and that they maybe didn't know about coming to college. And that is part of what college is about. Um, you know, uh, education is about changing your mind, really, right? That's essentially what it's about. And so we, not all of it is necessarily negative. So we, you know, it's not all ne necessarily a problem. Some of those students are also going into other science fields. Uh, they may be going into other quantitative science fields, quant quantitative social science fields too. So they may be exploring their uh, quantitative interests and skills and propensity in, you know, and sort of a predisposition toward thinking quantitatively in other areas. So um, that isn't, it, not all of that is necessarily an indicator of a problem. Where we focus is um, on ensuring that we are, that those, that um, out migration from the intended, the intention of declaring MPS majors to other fields is not patterned by race and gender or other uh, demographic characteristics. That's what we focus. So if all of a sudden there was a rush to a new field for many, many students. In fact, one can argue that over time there's been a rush to science, right? Because we many years ago we tried very hard to recruit people to science, and that was that was our challenge, just recruit students to science. Now we see a lot of interest in science, but it might take expression in other forms. What we want to be sure of is that that cannot be predicted by demographic characteristics and it can't and it and, and it isn't patterned in that form. So uh, it's a you asked a really good and complicated question. And I'm, I hope I've done a little bit of justice to it, but um, it, is a, it is a complicated question. And it, I mean, the answer to that is very, ha has to be nuanced and complicated. So we're going to take the next question from Wake. Well, hi, hi, Colette. Yeah, thanks for the talk. Um, you, you mentioned in passing and discussing the, the Moore grant that you had ideas for um, tackling this problem at scale. And that seems really challenging to me. I, I know we're in, in my group having difficulties just meeting the needs of our of our students. Could you say a little bit more about what the ideas are, how to make programs that would really reach out to all of the, the students who need uh, need support? Yeah, so you know this is the challenge, and um, let's check in in a few years and see how we've done, right? So um, I'm not going to say you know that we we've, we've we've demonstrated that it can be done at scale. I'm saying that we have the promise to do it at scale. Um, one of the, I think, um, important issues about this is, or one of the important ways that we can do this at scale is by reframing our thinking on this. So if we think of uh, the members of the physics department, and in this case, we're talking about undergraduates, right, for the MPS Scholars Program. If we think about them as largely a homogeneity, homo, a uh, genius group, right? With some exceptional uh, students who don't fit that homogeneous pattern. And we try to address the, um, 
separately the groups that are that don't fit that homogeneous um, you know prototype, if you will, then we'll keep doing the things that we, we're doing. And I, I think we will be failing to acknowledge the actual heterogeneity in the department and the heterogeneity that is to come as the population changes. So along these lines, what I think MPS scholars starts to do is it starts to say, how do we make the department as a whole, a place that supports and encourages a heterogeneous, heterogeneous um, population of students that's designed for them, that's designed to support them, and where we understand that there are a lot of different kinds of um, needs. There are a lot of different um, layers of preparation coming in. Um, and there's there uh, uh, and we need to address all of that. We need to that 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 all of that heterogeneity is um, is part of who we are in physics, right? And so it's a different framing than what we've had in the past. It's a different framing than what we've done in the past. And when I say we, I mean we all you know, across the campus, across the nation, in the sciences, outside of the sciences, people in the DEI world. <laughs> like, you know, it, this is, um, it's a shift in, it's a real shift in thinking. It requires a real shift in thinking. And um, yes, like the rubber, where the rubber hits the road, how do we actually accomplish that? Um, one of the uh, strategies that we're using is to invite students into um, pyramidal mentoring structures and invite all students into pyramidal mentoring structures um, to integrate the, the, that uh, work in um, MPS scholars with the existing student organizations, structures for mentoring, um, to deeply involve and engage the faculty in that and to do it in ways that are um, manageable for the faculty given their own workloads and constraints and things like that. Um, so, and thinking through the specifics of how this program gets designed and implemented, that's how, that's what's on, um, our desks. And I don't just mean me in the Dean's office folks. I mean, a fact, there's a faculty advisory board, a staff advisory board. We'll soon be forming a student advisory board. We'll be working in the departments, um, to try to lay out how we're going to, uh, build this program to meet that uh, vision. So you've asked a great question. Um, and I think um, the question also has embedded in it the right challenge. Thank you. Um, we have an anonymous uh, question about uh, the, the, the uh, feeling that uh, undergraduate classes, uh, lower division classes are weeding out students with um, less than ideal background. And the question is, what can we done to, to support the students? Yeah, so that, um, that's a good question. That's a really good question. And that is um, precisely the, um, there are two ways that we're strategically looking at that. One is with the Alex program. So, or what we now are, what is now named the Pre-Calculus Essentials Program. So looking at ensuring that students have, so this is in math. Um, I, don't, I don't know how far that will go or whether that will go into other disciplines in any way, but that is a program that says, okay, how do we make sure that um, all students have the uh, tools to uh, brush up on, beef up on, learn, material that they that they got and have forgotten in high school that they didn't get in high school because some students just didn't get it. This is a reality of, um, you know, inequity, uh, uh, um, you know, across the state and, and really across the country that um, is, you know, extremely uh, well studied and documented in the educational literature by people. You know, so how do we, um, how do, you know, how do we make sure that when students come here to Berkeley and they are in our division, that we are um, sure to provide them with the resources they need to succeed here and that we're not simply reinforcing or replicating um, those uh, disparities and inequities that happened in the K through 12 system. 
So we tackle it head on and have to address that. Um, but beyond that, the other strategy is the second um, key recommendation of the steering committee, which was to think really carefully about how we use, how we design and how we use discussion sections. To think carefully about what uh, GSIs, graduate students who are teaching in those discussion sections, their preparation, their training, their readiness to um, teach to a very diverse um, population of undergraduates and to really maximize the use of the time um, that already they and their students are spending in discussion sections. And so that's, uh, uh, those are the two strategies that we're using to tackle that particular issue. We would like to change those courses from being, you know, what are typically called um, gatekeeping courses into gateway courses. Right? We'd like to be sure that those experienced students have in those courses uh, enables them, supports them and enables them, encourages them and provides them with a um, kind of learning environment to want to go on in, um, in our division to want to go on with their quantitative studies. And if they choose not to do it, it's because something else just is so compelling to them, not because something that happened to them in those, that course um, demoralized or discouraged um, or dissuaded them. Uh, we have one, uh, uh, let's take one last question from uh, the Q&A. Um, what ideas do you have to address the additional burden that uh, underrepresented minorities, uh, minority folks are asked to carry in DEI work? Yep, huge issue. Um, so, I'm, I'm gonna um, just go back a minute to a past era. Um, when I started to do this work, when I first came out and started to work with Buford, I, within a year or two, could name all of the people around the country in our fields who were really doing ex you know, extensive work to increase DEI, uh, to increase diversity in these fields. I could literally, put a list on a piece of paper. These were people who um, were heroic in kind of incorporating this into their own scientific careers. These were faculty, almost all faculty of color and, uh, and, and women, um, particularly women working on gender issues, faculty of color working across the board on both race and gender issues. Um, and um, that has changed and I, I say that with, um, you know, I say that with a um, with hopefulness. That has changed. There are now um, many more people, many more people, and over the past year or so, um, with the kind of reckoning that has happened, many, many more people who would like to contribute um, and who would like to. Uh, make sure that what they do actually works towards solving some of the problems related to um, race-based in, inequity and inequitable outcomes. And I think it is really important that we provide infrastructures of support, programmatic approaches that can um, incorporate all of that energy and goodwill and effort um, and and where people are contributing in sync in a coordinated way to affecting real and measurable outcomes. And if we're able to do that, that, that will relieve some of the burden, some of the excessive burden that underrepresented scientists currently carry, continue to carry around DEI work. I also want to say that in this particular department, so put me in a different department and I may or may not say this, but in this particular department, there has been extraordinary effort from many, many uh, people working on DEI effort. This is across the board, uh, faculty, staff, graduate students, undergraduates. Um, and uh, I think um, as we, you know, this is part of, why I am um, making a, an argument, if you will, for um, being strategic, for using data to guide us, 
for being evaluative and assessing whether our efforts work, for understanding the extent to which things work and don't work, for um, you know, uh, creating the structures that we think will work, the programmatic responses, um, and for distributing um, the responsibility for that across the department and for embedding it and locating it within the department. This is one of the reasons why I argue for this is so that that effort can become more broadly and widely distributed. It needs to be, um, it needs to be. And I believe the will is there to do it. Honestly, I do. I think the will is there to do it. I think we haven't uh, created really over time for lots of good reasons um, or for lots of resource strapped reasons and um, or for lots of not understanding well enough because we have been learning, right? All of us nationally and also locally and also in the department and also in the campus, um, how to create the right structures so that people can contribute yeah, across the board, not only underrepresented minority scientists. And, and I should say not restrict, I shouldn't restrict it, that to scientists you asked about, you said folks and folks it is, it's uh, scientists, it's staff, it's um, many people. 